Okay, good afternoon. Hope everybody had a great lunch. Uh, as Brent said, I'm Tom Labatall. I'm with a group called the Environmental Institute. We're part of a bigger group called ATC Associates. And I teach for a living, which means a 15 minute presentation for me is just getting warmed up. <laughs> so in the long run, uh, I'll do my best to get through this. I promise Linda, because I have a bad habit of going long to get this in 15. We're here to talk about a hero, see a hero? That's schools. We're gonna be talking about schools. We're here about prevention, right? All is not well with the world, but let me explain how this works. All right, so we'll do a quick overview. I'll show you a little bit of history here, what a hero really is, and again, I'll explain what that term means, and then some basic information about how that regulation works, and we'll talk about problems at the end. All right, so the EPA has been involved with schools for some time. You go back in 1979, you could actually see what we call the, the uh, Technical Assistance or TAP program. EPA actually worked with AARP. Is everybody familiar with AARP, American Association of Retired Persons? And they brought in engineers and architects to provide uh, guidance for folks uh, doing asbestos management and building, so that was a good first step. 1982 was the first step in trying to regulate asbestos in schools. Uh, it was the very first time that we said for schools to go out and take samples of what we call friable materials, which I will describe for you, and then talk to the PTAs and the parents, but they didn't tell them what to say very well. So this became sort of like the beginning of our dot-com bubble, if you will. Uh, the asbestos removal activity went bananas because of fear, uh, but um, this was literally the beginning of that era. Some of the old documents that we have, and I have most of these things over the years. The Orange Book is uh, from 79, uh, was one of the first guidance documents we have, and then we had an initial, you can see a document there on questions and answers to help with schools. The one on the left is uh, uh, inspections and or surveys, and we go into buildings, how do we actually do that? So they've added a number of documents, actually. This is the first one, there was another one called the Pink Book that came along. <laughs> Uh, the one that's on the right, the, what we call the blue book, and you see by these colors, we tend to call them the colors uh, by the cover, uh, was really the first time the EPA tried to put something in a consolidated version. But then they came out with a thing called the purple book, which in my era, uh, 1988 when that, um, or 85 when that came out, that was our Bible. It was basically everything we knew. Uh, there was no OSHA, there was no EPA regulations as we know them now. I mean, they, you could have literally put them between your fingers barely in terms of what they were. And then in 88, you can see where we actually put a guidance document for schools after this thing we call a HERA came along. But folks, there are dozens of these things. I'm just giving you some history. Then the thing that really kind of gave us an, a, a first inclination that we were having problems with schools is the EPA actually went back and looked at compliance with the program that they had put in place. And it was our first uh, idea formally that we really didn't hit the mark as we were hoping to. All right, so because I know Linda archives these, I wanted to put the official stuff in here. Remember, this is a statute. We start with a law, that's section 203 or title two of the Toxic Substance Control Act, and we call it the Asbestos, Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act, or AHERA. Uh, we call it asbestos containing materials in schools, and you can see that 40 CFR part 763, subpart E, the lawyers love that stuff. But 40 is EPA, so anytime you see E40, that's an EPA regulation and asbestos containing materials in schools. Now there's two big important appendices I wanna mention. Appendix C is what we call the model accreditation plan. That's the requirements for training. It started out with schools, but now it's everything that we do. One thing that's very important here, worker protection rules, subpart G, state, city, and county people in this country that are in those employments are not covered by our Occupational Safety and Health Act, OSHA, but they are for asbestos. And it's called the Worker Protection Act. It's a general industry and construction standard. Okay, so let's go over to here. We call this a here in conversation, folks, and it applies to, if you look here, where it says applies, okay, over here, okay, this is about the third line, to local education agencies, typically school systems, uh, public and private, K through 12, and then we also have these charter schools that have come along, it applies to them. Notice where the arrow is, in buildings least owned or used as a school. So it's not just the brick and mortar buildings. Does, does your school system use trailers back behind the schools because of overflow? That's required. Anything that's used for K-12 instruction and the administration of that education is required, okay, to be in part of this program. All right, so then you see ACBM. You've probably heard of asbestos containing material. We use the term ACBM. We put a word building in there, and that means typically the friable and non-friable materials that we're looking for inside of the buildings. We don't typically do the exterior parts of schools. 
Now, I do want to make clear one factoid type slide. A uh, real misconception is AHERA is not an asbestos removal program. A lot of people seem to think we went into schools and purposely removed all the asbestos from all the schools. There could be nothing more than the truth. AHERA is what we call a management program. We do inspections, we do assessments, we write these documents called management plans. And then as things need to be removed, we call response actions, then what we could do is make those recommendations and the school may offer them. We have removal, encapsulation, enclosure, repair, operations and maintenance. And that thing you heard about called encapsulation is very rarely done today, it doesn't work. Okay, then we have down below there, you see asbestos niche app, that's where removal lives, okay? That's also the same regulation my colleague talked about with homes not being covered, four units or less. Homes are not covered by this regulation, nor are they covered by OSHA. Okay? unless you hire someone to come into your house to do work. All right, so NESHAP is where removal lives, prior to demolition and renovation, okay? And then OSHA, asbestos construction, which is where we do asbestos disturbing activities as your work practices and worker protection. Just briefly, I'm not gonna go through this, I just wanted you to see this as a, as a slide. Uh, we live in a big world of regulations and to explain this takes hours, but please do understand it's not a five minute conversation, it takes a very long time to understand each one of these regulations and how they apply. All right, so the basics of a hero, we have to perform those surveys or inspections and we have to reinspect schools every three years. That doesn't always happen. Develop, maintain and update what we call a management plan, which is our philosophies. Provide yearly notifications to teachers, employee organizations, and to caregivers regarding uh, that management plan document, but very importantly, when we have significant activities like asbestos removals. They're supposed to have a designated person called a designee. They have to perform periodic surveillance every six months, making sure the material is staying in decent condition and ensure that accredited professionals do the work like our inspectors and uh, abatement contractors and the like. And there's various levels of training and, and licensing there. And then they're supposed to have awareness training for their maintenance staff as well, which doesn't always happen. All right, so what's a survey? Basically, you're looking for asbestos materials within the building, friable and non-friable. And again, friable materials are those that you can crush up with hand pressure when they're dry has to be performed by accredited people, which means they have to be trained and they, many states have to be licensed. They take samples, we call bulk samples, they go to labs for analysis. And these, this work started in 88 and then they were supposed to keep up with this every three years. And I do want you to know that when we send people out to look for these samples in these buildings, there's a very specific methodology here. It's not just one of this and one of that, which unfortunately we see in other types of work. Okay, just some pictures here, because Linda said we'd better to make sure everybody understood friable. If you look at that pipe insulation, it's in very bad condition of that fireproofing. It doesn't take much to get pieces of that, guys. That's friable, it releases asbestos very easily. Now see the floor tile here in good condition, that is considered non-friable. But when we get into a removal circumstance, see the picture here where, there's, where they're just busting up the floor tiles? That could be done safely, it's done every day. But if it's not done in controlled conditions, folks, this could release a significant amount of asbestos. Okay, geometric amount of asbestos. Oh, but it's non-friable. Horse hockey, it releases asbestos plenty. Okay, then the assessment part, condition. It's not just finding it, you gotta explain to the schools what condition it's in, which makes sense, okay? So we look to find whether it's damaged, significantly damaged, potential for damage. This is where removal might come in. So we find things that are damaged, significantly damaged, we might go and do something about it. So again, it's not required to do removal. We usually do it based on these recommendations. And then they write reports. And then we do a thing called a management plan, and you can see we have the Reinstein High School management plan. <clears throat> Doesn't she look good on that? Okay. All right, so basically we have a person called a management planner, and what they do is they put these together, and think of this as the philosophy of how the school's gonna handle their issues, either as a school system or an individual school. Here you'll find your inspection and O&M plan if you wanna go dig in yourself. Okay, they're supposed to update these things periodically. They do or they may not. All right, so an issue of time, let's keep going here. The problems, guys, we have a huge problem with compliance with the HERA. Doesn't mean all school systems, though. Please, let's make that clear, okay? Inspections and management plans absolutely do not represent the current conditions we find in schools. Many of these schools have no idea where the records even are, if they exist at all. If so, staff members are not trained, awareness, or what we call maintenance. This can lead to accidental disturbances by your maintenance staff and subcontractors because communication doesn't exist, okay? Also, I guarantee that things like uh, the parents and caregivers are not finding out about significant activities as we found in California. And I want you to be very clear with this. Friable, or what we call high-risk removal projects, occur every day in schools that are very much out of compliance with OSHA and EPA. And it's a risk to the abatement workers, 
potentially to their children in that school and the staff, because they don't even do what we call final clearance air sampling in some cases, which is just nuts in my book, but it goes on every day. It's got to the point with the schools, they've got to like the building owners, they get the yellow pages, find a contractor, they don't do half of what they're supposed to do, because they don't actually know what the requirements are anymore. All right, so Huntington Beach, you might have seen in, um, uh, Linda's been following this issue. We had some schools out in California where they found some real hazards and they moved kids out. They've done a lot of renovations and they moved the kids back. But the fact is, I also follow the press very closely and I have my own blog and various other things. I have seen circumstances with schools where people have significantly overreacted. But there have been plenty of times when people have done absolutely the right thing. And unfortunately, because we don't communicate with people, we don't do the training, we don't keep up with these programs, all of this communication falls apart, and we were supposed to be proactive. We have turned into a reactive program now, instead of being proactive. So parents, because they don't get information in front of them on a regular basis, every time they find out there's asbestos in the school, they panic whether there's a need to or not. Some of these schools, it's nothing more than some floor tile and drywall joint compound. Not all schools have pipe insulation and fireproofing and soundproofing. It varies, and it varies all over the country depending on where you are. The older the place that you live, the more likely you're going to have some of these circumstances. The newer the schools you have, you might have less likely material. There's no such thing as zero. We always have to look. There's no end date when surveys have to be performed, and schools have to do this every three years. So further then, just a couple more. Um, we've got a report that came out from Senators Markey and Boxer uh, that a lot of us like. They did a polling of 20, uh, the whole country, they only got 20 states to reply, and only three of them were close to being in compliance. They really kind of put a bloody eye, uh, kind of a bruised eye uh, on the state program. Some of these state programs really try hard. There's no funding, folks. Okay, so as an opinion, that's why I put it as a box at the bottom there, as an opinion. Is a hero failing its intended mission? I think so, and badly in many cases. Guys, in Georgia, our non-compliance rate, where my home, home office is, is greater than 80% non-compliance with the HERA. And if you look at Markey's report, you'll see a lot of that. It's mostly turnover. It has mostly to do with we have young people in their 30 years old, master's degree, now they're a principal in a school. They don't know anything about asbestos. They wouldn't even know where to look for these records. That's what the regulators will tell you, okay? Federal funding is key here, folks. Without federal funding, you're gonna lose every time for enforcement on these things. I did want to mention, if you need some good basic information about asbestos, uh, the EIA has redone that purple book I showed you earlier. We rewrote that. And it represents best industry knowledge of not only the regulations, but of current industry practices. So if you need something like that, let, let us know. Uh, you can get it through the EIA webpage. You can talk to Brent or I about it. It's not specifically for schools, but it does represent the general industry knowledge in terms of how we go about doing our work. If you need information about school stuff, please let me know. I have a raft of things I could send you uh, that I have in my own archives. And I think that's it for me. And we'll take questions later, I think. Okay? Thank you.